In today's video, we look at movement for peak performance. And today's brain rule, surprisingly enough, move it. Believe it or not, physical exercise makes you smarter. Neuroscientists now know that exercise stimulates growth factors in the brain that support and assist with the development of not only memory, but learning. This video explores the best type of physical exercise for the brain and explains how exercise impacts on the aging process. Brain rule four is move it. Humans are designed to move. Humans have been designed to operate in an unstable outdoor environment in more or less constant motion. Paleolithic humans move between 15 and 20 kilometers a day, chasing furry animals around the African savanna until they ran out of juice. The animals ran out of juice, that is, because we didn't spare them, at least to start with. We ran them to a trot, and when a furry animal trots, it can't pant. If it can't pant, it can't cool down. Humans can cool down because we sweat through our mostly hairless skin. And that's our advantage. Humans are designed to move and chase after furry animals. Now, I'm not suggesting you go out and chase the nearest furry animal, but what I am suggesting is that movement is what makes you human and makes you that operational system, that integrated ecosystem, work the best. Let's think about some tips for getting active, getting incidental activity back in your day. First of all, let's talk about the GOYA principle. G O Y A. Now I know you're wondering what that means. It's short for get off your ass. Sitting is not activity. Standing and moving is. So how do you get the go your principle into your life? Well, one thing I use at my mainly sedentary office job is I now stand up at my desk. I have an electric height adjustable desk and I spend a good part of my day standing and moving. And I make the effort to go and, I don't know, talk to someone rather than emailing them. Some relatively simple but easy, easy things that you can do day to day are talking to other people, drinking lots of water so you get up and go to the toilet more, and taking regular breaks. Incidental activity is responsible for a large part of our daily energy expenditure. If it's your weight you're interested in managing, Incidental activity is essential. That forms the largest voluntary part of our daily energy expenditure. Moving and just moving a little bit all the time is essential. Exercise is very, very important for our brain health, but habitually moving, that accidental or incidental activity is even more crucial for energy expenditure. Why do some people age so well and others so poorly. There's this trajectory of healthy un and unhealthy ageing. The scientists now would say to us, the single biggest predictor of healthy ageing is the presence or absence of a healthy lifestyle, particularly sedentary behaviour. If you have a sedentary life that will set you down this course of unhealthy ageing, an active lifestyle take you through on that positive trajectory. In fact, scientists are now talking about SEDS, sedentary death syndrome, the notion that an inactive lifestyle will kill you. Historically, humans have been highly active, but today we spend most of our time sitting. Let's assume you followed the brain rule, defend it, and you're getting seven to eight hours of sleep per night. That leaves between 16 and 17 hours left in the day. 16 to 17 hours of opportunity. Opportunity to move or opportunity to be sedentary and sit. We need to think about different components of physical activity and not just exercise. When we think of these opportunities, it's helpful to look at the components of physical activity. We have what we call dedicated physical activity. That's exercise or sport or organized movement. We also have workplace physical activity, 
what you do in your work job. Do you sit most of the day or are you active? That leaves us with incidental physical activity. What do you do when you're not exercising and when you're not actually at work? Do you just sit on the couch or are you moving? Let's take two different hypothetical people. One person who maximizes opportunities for movement and one who maximizes opportunities for sitting. And let's get down into the metabolism and see what's going on inside their bodies and their brains. So what would the person who's maximizing the opportunities for sitting do? Well, they'd sit for breakfast, probably 20 minutes. They would drive to work and sit in the car, maybe half an hour or an hour, maybe more. They then go into work and they would sit at their desk and stay there mostly for an eight to nine hour period, maybe even eat lunch at their desk. They would then drive home and they would sit as they're driving. Then they would get home, they would have dinner and sit again, maybe another 20 minutes or a half an hour. And then they would relax by sitting and watching television. What they're doing is not only are they missing out on the physical activity, and not only are they missing out on the calorie burn, but they are destroying their metabolism. If we look down at a cellular level, we now know that sitting causes a chemical cascade within the body that destroys our bodies and brains to the point that we can now say if you are sedentary and particularly if you sit a lot, you're sending the message to the body and the brain, it's time to die. Because what's happening is the body shuts down critical components of metabolism. For one example, there's an enzyme called lipoprotein lipase. It's a complex sounding enzyme. What it does is it burns fat in your body. If you sit for more than eight hours per day, this enzyme gets turned off. And even the government guidelines of 30 minutes of physical activity does not turn it back on. So what happens is weight gain happens over time. And with most people, obesity is a slow cumulative process of maybe two or three kilos per year. So as well as destroying that aspect of metabolism and fat burning, what happens is they put on weight and the fat around the belly is particularly dangerous. It produces another molecule, a range of molecules called adipose cytokines. Adipose from adipose or fat tissue. Cytokines are little signaling molecules that basically can trigger inflammation throughout the body and the brain. Now, when I say inflammation, most people will think of swelling, of redness, and a bit of pain. If you, for instance, are to go over on your ankle, but there's a more sinister form of inflammation. This is cellular inflammation. So the person who sits not only loses the ability to burn fat, but that then creates this deluge of inflammation, which we now know accelerates aging, creates chronic disease, and destroys brain cells. Contrast this with the person who maximizes the opportunity for movement. So this individual would certainly do some dedicated physical activity, ideally in the morning. They would probably take public transport and walk to the bus stop or the train or the tram stop, they would probably get off a stop early so they could walk. When they got to work, they would take the stairs rather than the escalator. When they're working, they might have a ritual whereby if the phone rang, they stood up to take a phone call. Or they walked when they were talking on their mobile. Or in an ideal world, they had something like a stand-up desk. At lunchtime, 
they would take the opportunity to go for a walk, get some fresh air, and recharge the brain. And on the way home, they would take public transport and use the stairs rather than the escalator. When they got home, they would do some movement around the house, maybe have a hobby or a relaxation that involves some form of movement rather than sitting in front of the television for hours. Because we know that with people who exercise, those who sit and watch television for three hours a day tend to be as fat as those who do no exercise at all. Taking advantage of all of these opportunities for movement throughout the day will give somebody a great base and level of health of their body and brain, but dedicated physical activity is the holy grail if we want to be peak performers. The reason is of the increase in intensity. And when we do intense physical exercise, what happens is the contracting muscles create a whole wave of growth factors that not only help the body to absorb glucose and other types of, of nutrients, but also help the brain to absolutely flourish. The star of these growth factors is something called brain-derived neurotropic factor, or BDNF. The word neurotropic means nerve growth. This stuff has been called miracle grow for the brain. In fact, when you sprinkle it on a Petri dish with neurons, they proliferate or grow like crazy. The best source of BDNF is intense physical activity. Any movement helps. More intense means more BDNF, means more new neurons, and it has a huge role in learning and memory. Other growth factors are VEGF and FGF. These two growth factors help to build the transport network in our brain. All of the little blood vessels and capillaries that supply vital blood, oxygen and nutrients to every single one of our 100 billion neurons. Think of it as the infrastructure in a country. It's the roads, the railways and the airports that enable a country to actually be very productive. It's the same for your brain. Do you want these growth factors or not? The last of these growth factors is insulin-like growth factor one or IGF-1. This has a significant role in learning and memory in the brain and helps BDNF to be expressed in the brain. And we get IGF-1 from lactic acid. That's the sort of heaviness that you get in your legs and muscles when you exercise intensely. If you want to be a peak performer, intense physical activity is critical. We also know about movement now that complex movement is tremendous for the brain. When I move my arms and legs independently, I activate the cerebellum, which sits under the brain, but has projections all the way through to the opposite cortex. So rather than sitting on a gym on the machines, we should be doing more complex integrated movements, and particularly ones that cross the midline of the body, which is why things such as yoga and Tai Chi can be so beneficial for the brain. Now that we know all of this stuff about movement, it really boils down to one thing, choice. You choose how much or how little you move during the day. You choose whether your brain will be optimal or whether you are accelerating towards an early death. Okay. 
So you've always known that exercise is good for your heart health, but now you know how important it is in terms of maximizing brain function and how it is the key to slowing down cognitive decline as we age. Remember, no one is coming to save you, but you can save yourself.